podcast. some people that are awake out there. We are so glad you're here this morning. It is an exciting weekend. Uh, it has been an eventful weekend, okay? Uh, before we jump into a couple things, let me share with you some announcements, some ministry opportunity. The adult Bible study will be back on tonight. We've got two more weeks left of the praying at the crossroads. Uh, great series looking at some of the prayers to the Old Testament. Uh, at also at five o'clock, and I know we are a Baptist church, so I say this with a really strong emphasis. We have a kid's dance party. Okay, I know those who grew up Baptist, Baptist and dance don't know. So we're going to say we have a kid's Hebrew folk movement party. Okay, you can call it whatever you want. But they're going to be, here's the big thing though, they're getting ice cream too. All right? Uh, for kids only, BJ. I saw BJ's face light up at ice cream. He was kind of excited. Real quick, let me take a survey. How many men out there are wearing your socks? That, praise the Lord. Thank you for not wearing Bermuda shorts, and you didn't have to show us. I just said how many. Can, you, I was raising my foot. You were raising your foot. Okay. Uh, so we're there. At tonight, uh, right after church today, this morning, when I get done with the sermon, if you are a parent or a kid that is going, a parent of a kid that is going, a huge Mission Fuge, which is going to be in North Carolina this year, they will have a, a short 15, 20-minute meeting down in the youth room, okay? So greet one another and say to one another, hey, glad you're here, but i got to go because it costs 
I really, you're, you're, David doesn't scare you, but if you don't show up on time, Holly should scare you. Let's just kind of leave that one out there. All right, so right after church, 15, 20 minutes, parents of kids that are going to Fuge and kids that are going to Fuge. And that's the last announcement. All right, this week has been busy. Um, several things have been going on. Let me introduce a few things. We're going to do the Act Teens one first. David, Donald, and Lisa, so you're prepared. Uh, we had, uh, we were able to minister in our Act Teens, which is our teen female group, our teen girls. They did a mission trip to Madison Heights, and they they hosted a BBS for, um, and the, the church is totally, it's the prayer card of the week, actually. Oakdale. Oakdale. I was going to say Oak Grove, because that's the church I was going to, I didn't know what I so, in Oakdale, so here's the thing. We're going to watch a video in a second, but you can actually write a letter to that church, encourage them, encourage your children's ministry, their pastors, and the address is in the bulletin. That's our prayer card of the week. It's exciting. But instead of me sitting here and telling you, uh, let's just watch about a two-minute video to give you a recap of the Ag Teens Missions Endeavor.
race team makes their way up. We are glad that we were able to participate in these two great events. I appreciate every one of you that not only prayed for these kids, trusted your kids to our ministries, but also supported these, these ministries, not only through your regular offerings, but I know many of y'all gave special scholarships. Many of y'all enabled this to be happen. It was a tremendous week as they saw the wonder of God. And I don't know how much it changed the kids, but I know Jonathan Garrett came back totally changed. All right. So, and from what I understand, this was the first time in about 10 years that Susan uh, Harris has not been to Central Kids with her own kids. All right, because she's always had a kid along the way. It's been, so it's been a great year. It really has. And the, the thing is, summer's not even half over yet. We still got stuff to do. VBS, Mi Mission Fuge with our kids, and other events taking place. So we're so excited. Today we are talking about God delivers us. Today we're going to be talking about how we sometimes are oppressed and we're bound, and it seems like we are in an unwinnable situation. And I want you to know that there is a warfare going on that desires Christians to be cramped, to be bound, to be bondaged. And we need to know that God is a God that came to set us free. One of the other great events that took place this week, if you have not, and if you, if you have not watched the news in the last 24, 48 hours, and you may not be aware of it, uh, the Supreme Court came down with their Dodd case. Powerful decision. And, and to be honest, it is not a decision that changes any morality or changes anything because the battle is not won in Washington. The battle is won in the hearts and lives of men, but it is a battle. If you have not heard, the, uh, the pregnancy center out in Lynchburg got vandalized last night. Tremendous uh, bricks through windows, and graffiti, the damage and all that. We need to be praying, and the battle now is going, the, the, the fight for lives is headed back to, to the states, uh, it, and we need to understand that Christians, this is not a time to rest. This is a time to say God is a God that sets people free no matter what bondage they are set in. And we are a God, we are worshipers of a God that says, God, you are great. And we you are worthy to be praised. Now, all that going on this week, but you might just be caught in your own trap. You might feel bound. You might feel constricted. You might feel like the world's pressure is just coming down. I hope before you leave today, you can express that you believe that our God is bigger than anything this world throws at us. Our God is bigger than any spiritual warfare and worldly power that can come upon us. That it is not by our might, but by His Spirit, saith the Lord. And we worship a big God. And He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There is none above Him, and there is none that can constrict Him. And we worship that God. So would you stand with us as we sing, that, sing our songs and sing our praises to the King of kings, the one who sets us free. In the darkness we were waiting, without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes, to fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word, from a throne of endless glory, to a grave.
Would you be seated? And y'all can go to the front row for just a few minutes. Living hope. We say it. We sing it. But do we really believe it? We find ourselves bound by pressures of this world, of time demands, of parental demands, of job demands. We, we get bound by, by sickness and illnesses and maybe not even our own. And sometimes it is just circumstances that seem to be overwhelming. As a new grandfather, uh, a first-time grandparent, the, the, the concept of knowing my kids are down there is tough. Knowing that my daughter-in-law has a co-worker about her same age that lost her one-year-old daughter who got out the dog door and went to the pool. And how do you feel about talking to someone who is excited about their new child, Sammy, my grandkid, her baby, uh, who looks like a nestus, and I'm sorry for that, okay? <laughs> but how do you feel about that when you're talking about that around a mother that is mourning and weeping? And then we get bound and tied up by sin and, and habits that we know we shouldn't be doing. And like Paul, the things I want to do, I'm not doing the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. And so we found this, this pressure we put up on ourselves and we, and we even judge ourselves to make ourselves feel guilty. I want to show you a video, it's a little longer, it's about eight minutes, and I'm going to Make sure the volume's a little loud, but there is conversation that's not quite, it's, it's a little softer. Maybe it's me being in this dead zone of the stage, but I want to make sure you hear the soft talking that's going on. It is a skid guide video, but it is a serious video. And this video is called The Verdict. seen it time and time and again, a courtroom scene. Someone is being charged with a crime, and the lawyers parade the witnesses in and out. Their very testimonies have the power to swing the pendulum of fate. The jury, they sit and they listen and they deliver a verdict, and then the judge slams down the gavel and declares a sentence. But what about you? Is the jury still out on you? Do you live this day in and day out existence as though someone has handed you a guilty verdict? It feels like we live the good parts and the bad parts of our lives as though they're on a set of scales. And inevitably, the bad stuff, it always seems the heaviest. In John chapter 8, we find a woman that was literally dragged out of bed with the man that she was having an affair with. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, she was caught in the act. We know nothing about her past. We have no idea if this is a long-standing affair, 
and she just really didn't feel bad about it anymore. Or maybe she had a cruel husband and she felt depressed and all of a sudden here comes this man that just finds her fascinating. Regardless, the two of them in a fit of passion make this huge mistake. And she had no idea that she was going to be torn from that bed, thrown into public, probably naked, to tumble upon the fate of Jesus. And her accusers want Jesus to judge her. Can you imagine the tape that was playing in her mind that day? Oh, what have I done? I can't believe I keep making the same mistakes. Look at these people judging me, mocking me gone too far. I have gone way too far for God to ever love a screw up like me. Those are real thoughts. And if I'm honest, there's been a good portion of my life where I felt like my soul has been in the courtroom. Not that I was thrown in front of a large crowd where all my sins lay naked for the whole world to see, but I know what I've done. I have dark secrets just like you. I have declared myself guilty. How does guilt manifest itself in everyday life? Have you ever been given a compliment but you just brush it off? Has anyone ever tried to break through that tough exterior to show you love but your wall is so high there's just no way anyone can get through and you find yourself yet again alone? Shame and guilt are powerful prisons. But it doesn't have to be that way. There is no jury declaring you guilty. Our innocence is found in Christ. The only sentence you have is found in Romans chapter 8 that says, For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those would be the words that would change this woman's life forever. But before she heard those words, she heard Jesus say as he looked at the crowd, If any of you have never made a mistake, if you are perfect, Go ahead and start throwing rocks. And Jesus looked at this woman and said, Woman, where is your jury? Who's condemning you? And the woman looked around and everybody was gone. And she looked at Jesus. She said, No one. No one is condemning me. And then Jesus looked at the woman and said, Well, I don't condemn you either. Go, go and sin no more. Can you imagine the look on this woman's face when she realized her verdict? Not guilty. And we have been given the same verdict. Aren't you tired of beating yourself up over your past? When are you gonna stop being judge and jury and even executioner of your own life? Because if you look in the jury box, no one is there. And if you go to the judge's bench, no one is swinging a gavel declaring your condemnation. And there's not going to be any surprise witnesses coming in at the last minute to bring up embarrassments from your past. You are free. Almost every prophet of the Old Testament 
in the middle of the judgment, in the middle of the you will, your sins will be paid, need to be paid for, in the middle of all that cursing that comes from God, almost every prophet in the Old Testament also gives a twist with hope. And Isaiah said it this way, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. No matter what you're going through, no matter what life is throwing at you, you need to know that our God is more powerful than any prison chains. Our God is more powerful than any guilt, than any conviction, than anything. It, it is, he is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and he is the living hope. And if you don't believe that he's more powerful, the greatest chains of all the world, death could not hold him. Which is why Paul could say in Romans chapter 8, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who do good enough. No, that's not what he says. Now there is no condemnation for those who call themselves Baptists. That's not what he says. Now there is no condemnation for those who are on the right political party. That's not what he says. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I cannot break chains. You cannot break chains. You might break a chain here and there. You might free yourself a little bit. But the, ultimately, all the bindings and the bondage of this world will weigh us down. But the freedom that God brings is through Jesus Christ our Lord. So as our praise team makes their way up, we have one more song before our kids are dismissed. And I dig into Acts chapter 16. It is this song, Chain Breaker. Our God is a chain breaker. And I don't know what you are bound with. I don't know what holds you down. I don't know what you feel like you are that binds you. But if you are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. He is the one who opened prison doors. And when we sing this song, I hope you know it more than just words on a song. I hope you know it in the life that you live. So let's stand and sing Chain Breaker. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. You've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're trying to feel the same old hole inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got 
believe that, just tell somebody, I believe it, and then you can sit down. I it. All right, our kids, you are dismissed to Children's Church. Thank you for coming uh, to worship with us and with the singing. We have a great ministry for our younger kids. It's a powerful time for them. If you have your Bibles, if you would open up, we're going to be all over the place, but we're going to end up in Acts chapter 16 as we go from there. Let me share with you, this is my last week on prison doors, on doors, and I'm going to be talking about prison doors. And then next week, we start a one-month series, given a little bit with Vacation Bible School Madness and such, but a one-month series on Hebrew words. I'm going to teach you about a half a dozen or more Hebrew words. And if you don't know anything about Hebrew, it sounds a lot like Klingon. All right? And uh, so there's a kind of guttural method. So the front two pews will have covering in case, you know, spit starts coming out, out of me. So, you know, kind of like Gallagher, for those who know Gallagher in the water. Moving on, okay. And then in August, I'm excited about August, I'm going to be talking about relationships. Specifically, my concept is going to be digging into marriage and family relationships, but the principles that I see God sharing is, is to greater, greater breadth of that, but it's going to be nailing a little bit more specifically about families. And, um, and you may say, well, we're doing pretty good, but what I want to do is just kind of refresh, renew, and strengthen the relationships, specifically in the home, but also beyond that as well, okay? Now, with that said, uh, prison doors. You know, the prophet foretold in Isaiah 61, as I read earlier, uh, the amazing event, and again, prophet after prophet had judgment and judgment and cursing and and, and uh, consequences that had to be paid, but they always threw in hope. And in this, we get a principle that uh, is something phenomenal. Now, many people believe that uh, in the de first century, in the days of Jesus Christ, what would happen is a rabbi, you'd go into church like today, you'd go into church, and we, we model much of our modern day church after the synagogues. And so in the first century, they would go in, and a rabbi would come up, and it would be visiting rabbis, or the rabbi of the day, or the priest or the rabbi, they would pick somebody, and they would unroll the scroll. The scroll was rolled up, and they would unroll, and whatever they were at from the week before, there would be a little pointer, and they actually had little sterling silver pointers and fingers and things to tell you exactly where to start. They had no PowerPoint, they had no you know, videos, and, so, and then they would read the scripture. And in one day, in Luke chapter 4, there is this principle where Jesus goes to his hometown of Nazareth. And it's a Sabbath, so he does what he does. He goes to the synagogue. He goes to worship on, on the Sabbath with his kinfolk and with his family. And they're probably thinking, oh, here's this traveling rabbi. Here's this, he's knowledgeable, he's had to study. So they unroll the scriptures. He came up and he read the scriptures. Then he, unroll, then he rolled the scriptures back up. And whether he picked out the scripture, it doesn't say specifically. I kind of feel that by the providence of God, this was the exact text that God wanted them to hear, and it was the, what they were on for that day. And it is the text from, he is quoting Isaiah 61, which I just read, and it's on Luke 4. We see this. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set liberty those who are oppressed. And immediately I imagine all the Jews kind of going, yeah, we are going to get freedom from Rome, and this is from the prophet Isaiah, just like he got delivered from Nebuchadnezzar, and the Babylonians were going to be delivered today. And then Jesus, in modern illustration, he closed his Bible, and he said, this is fulfilled in your midst today. And I can imagine the local preacher going, what are you talking about? You know, and I can imagine, you know, Matt's over there scribbling down notes. Oh, this is what Jesus said, okay? And I can imagine Lisa's up in the sound booth going, this isn't on my PowerPoint. What am I supposed to do? You know, but he is saying, no, I am here. And I am the one that will deliver. I am the one that will liberate. I will bring sight to the blind. And you can go on through chapter 61 and read some more, but he stops right here. He said, why? Because the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And the only thing that my brain can imagine is this. My head explodes. Is 
this the Messiah? Is this the one that's going to come and break us free from the Roman bondage? Is this the one that's going to go to my cousin Louise or, or you know, uh, Elizabeth and heal her of her crippledness? Is this the one? You know, in this world, the video we watched, in this world, it's kind of like we live on a scale. We feel guilty, we do something wrong, we mess up, we sin, we say bad words, we have bad thoughts. Okay, when I went to church. But yeah, but I go, after church, I, you know, I yelled at my mom, I yelled at my parents. I, oh, wait a minute, I came Sunday night. But if you weigh it over and over and over, we lose. The bad things, from an accounting standpoint, the bad things outweigh the good things. Jesus says, yes, you are captive to your own sin, you are captive to your bondage, but I have come to sit on the other side of the scale and go this way. I bring freedom, and I deliver from all that to those who believe. So I look at this principle of prison doors. Good news to the poor, liberty to the captives, sight to the blind, liberty to the oppressed. And so I started looking through scriptures about prison doors, and not all prison doors are physical. All right? But I looked at some of the scenarios. So uh, I have a few texts in here, and we see it. Joseph was in prison. The nation Israel was in prison. Hezekiah was in prison or in a pit. Jeremiah thrown into a pit. Daniel thrown into a lion's den. John the Baptist thrown into prison. Stephen thrown into prison. Peter thrown into prison. John thrown into prison. Paul, Silas, over and over. I mean, there's a lot of prison stories. All right, a lot. And I want to share something. Not all of them were delivered the way that we thought they should have been. Jeremiah was thrown onto a, a, a horse and buggy, basically, and taken out of Israel, never to return. Daniel, never taken from his homeland as a young child, never again to see freedom for his, for his country. Stephen died. James killed. I mean, it's tough. So real quickly, I want to look at just three different cases. And then we're going to go to Acts 16. In Acts chapter 8, this is not a physical prison, though Stephen had been in prison, and he loses his life. They capture him, and they put him, and they judge him, and we know the story that they, they stoned him, and Paul was there holding the, the coats, basically indicating that he was one of the witnesses against Stephen. Stephen loses his life, but because of the persecution of Stephen, Philip is, and the other Christians and the other early apostles are driven out of Jerusalem, and Philip goes to Samaria. And you want to know what I believe? Samaria was a prison. Not like what we would think today, but it was a prison because God's people had said they're not good enough. They had set up bondage by race. You thought, ever thought about that? They kept the Samaritans down. You're not good enough because of the decisions that your great, great, great grandparents did. What did they do? They intermarried. So therefore, you're not good enough. How often do we judge people not because of what they're doing, but sometimes because of what generations ago did? Don't get me wrong, I'm not justifying and saying what was happening centuries ago or decades or generations ago was good, but I'm saying we still hold people in prisons like that. And what did Philip do? He went to testify to them. The same scenario that Jesus talked to the woman at the well which even his own apostles were kind of going, we don't need to be here. All right? And in Samaria, so he broke down the walls that we ourselves build. He went to broken people, people that were not considered good enough, bound people, not physically bound, but spiritually bound. You are not good enough to worship in Jerusalem. He went to discarded people. And how often do we as a country, or we as humans, discard people? Well, you know, they're from Pakistan. Or, well, you know, maybe gender we discard. But we discard. Maybe they went to the wrong school. You went to UVA and you say, well, that person.
first time I went to Virginia Tech, so you discard them. And I know that's a joke, but when I was at, in church in Virginia Richmond, there were people that would not look at, we were looking for a youth pastor, would not look for anybody from Liberty University because there was somebody that hated Liberty. And they discarded an entire university of, what, 100,000 students because of about a half a dozen people. Don't say that Christians don't do it either. How often do we say, well, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I, I'm joking here, but how often do we say, well, they're Methodists, or they're Lutherans? God went to set them free, and he used Philip. And you know how he used Philip? Because Stephen got killed. If it had not been for the death of Stephen, Philip may not have even gone out there. Persecution brought in there. And we should pray for the eyes of the end to be open. And Acts chapter 12, James was killed, and Peter was arrested by the same evil king. And four guards were set around him. And this is the story where they were praying for Peter from the outside. Deliver Peter, deliver Peter. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 12 that there, you know, the, the earth shook and he got out and, and he walked out and it says and there were angels that walked out with him and they opened the doors basically for him on the first two doors. But then it said there was an iron gate in Acts chapter 12. And it said, and it opened, the scripture says, it opened of its own accord. Stephen King, early part. Whoa! Right? Jesus, God Almighty, opened the prison door. And you know what happened the next day? He went, he was, he goes to the house. They don't even believe it's him. They think it's a ghost. He knocks on the door, and the girl that opened the door, they, they had just been praying for Peter to get out. They see Peter, and she slams the door in his face and said, there's a ghost at the door. There's power in prayer sometimes, even if we don't believe it. <laughs> there's still power. And the next day, you know what happened? The king was so enraged, he killed the guard. Now that's weird, because in Acts chapter 16, the guard gets saved. I don't know how God works all the time. Let me go back to Exodus chapter 2. Here's a great passage. In Exodus chapter 2, it is this principle that uh, it says that they groan. And the Hebrew, the Hebrew word for groan there actually could mean sigh. They sighed. They were so tired, so worn out. For 400 years they had been in Egypt, and now they were enslaved. And they were just tired of it. Have you ever been in so much bondage that you're just tired? You keep battling the same battles over and over? They sighed, and they said they cried out to heaven. They cried out to the Lord. And the Lord heard them. And this is where we get this beautiful image in Exodus where the Lord, okay, here's the people in Egypt getting ready and crying out to God. They're in, it says they were in horrible situations. They were in bondage, it says. And so what does God do? He starts to move over here. Hundreds of miles away, the people are suffering and they cry out. And God starts to work with Moses. Get up. Go set my people free. Hundreds of miles away, God is working. Sometimes we're sitting here praying and we don't see any way we can get out. And what we need to realize, God may already be working on the answer, but it might be in another state. So they cry out, they get up, and, and it's like they're prisoners of war, and they get out there, they cry out from their heart, and this next, go to the next slide, I believe it's the next slide, it says this. They cried out from their heart, but here's the point of these three prison stories. God opens the way. He got Moses ready. He does the plague. You go, it, God opens the way for Peter. You see there in Acts chapter 12. In Acts chapter 8, God opened the way for Philip to go into Samaria. And you're, no matter what bondage is, God is the one that opens doors. Okay? And he opens hearts. We see in Acts chapter you know, 12, he opened the heart. Philip was, they were, sorry, they were praying for Peter, and Peter get delivered. And they realized there is power in prayer. God opened their hearts. Back, backtrack to chapter 8, Philip goes into Samaria. And, he, and what does he tell them about? He tells them about Jesus. And God starts to open the hearts of the Samaritans. And it says in the next chapter that the, the apostles sent some of the apostles up to lay hands on them so they would receive the same spirit. The point about this is, a little rabbit trail. If they'd have been delivered, if they'd have been, uh, if they'd have created their own church by Philip, 
they still would have been a wall between them and Jerusalem. So God says to the apostles of Jerusalem, you get up there and you show them that wall, that prison that you have put them in is coming down. And we are one church, one Savior, one Spirit, one Lord. And then in Acts, in Exodus chapter 2, we see he, he opens the hearts, and he actually even closes hearts, like with Pharaoh. But it is God that does all this, and he opens prison doors. And there is nothing too big for him. Two doors, he walks with them, the iron door to Peter opens to myself, the prison doors of Egypt. Can you imagine trying to get out of the greatest army of the day, and you're bound by a door called the Red Sea? So what does God do? He opens the prison doors, and they walk through. I mean, there are other situations in, in the Bible about, about uh, prison doors, but let me just go to Acts chapter 16, because this one really kind of sparked my imagination, and I, I was listening to a sermon by a particular pastor, so part of this comes from him, not the text part, part of the imagination of what might have happened. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are there. Timothy joins them, and Paul has a vision. Paul wants to go one way, and God says go another way. So he goes to Macedonia, the Macedonian call, we call it, and you see the conversion of Lydia there, if you just read through the, the paragraph headers in chapter 16. But then in verse 16 it says this, As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. And she followed Paul and Silas, crying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. So that's pretty cool. You've got your own little marketing person following you around. Hey, they're from God. They're telling you about salvation. You listen to them. They're from God. They're telling about salvation. You listen to them. They're from God. They're telling you about salvation. Listen to them. And eventually what happens, they get to be like one of BJ's grandkids that won't let BJ go. Right? You know, mama, mom, mommy, mommy, mom, mommy. I'm sorry. I got a little, got a little. Uh, TV going on in my brain here. And so finally, and she kept doing this for many days. I mean, this is like stalking before the internet. All right? And Paul had him become greatly annoyed. How many of y'all ever gotten annoyed by your kid? <laughs> Moving on. Turned and said to the spirit, not to the girl, but to the spirit that was, that was possessing the girl, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. And when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they could no longer make money off this girl. They seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers, and when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturb disturbing our city, so the advocate customs, they are not lawful for us as Romans to accept our practice. Now what you don't realize is they were Romans, but they're, they're lying about them, and, or they're just you know, uninformed. So the crowd joined in attacking them, beat them, beat them with rods and kicks. Can you imagine the crowd, the mob, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into the prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received the order, he put them in the innermost prison, the darkest prison, and he fastened their feet. So here's kind of probably what's happening. Paul is lying there or sitting there or whatever. However, he can get as comfortable as he can with his feet in stocks and he can't lie down. There is no bed. And all Paul wants to do is survive the night and get up and just get out of camp. Probably. He's groaning. He's bloody. He has not eaten. He's weak. The mob soldiers and here's Silas same boat still beaten still bloody but then Silas starts this my hope my hope is built on nothing less 
time is for us to get through the night. Before it's over, Paul's kicking out in song two. In Jesus' blood and righteousness. And then together they sing out, when darkness seems to hide his face. And I can imagine that they're getting louder and everybody's starting to listen and, that they're, and the, other, the other prisoners are probably yelling for them to shut up now. All right, we're trying to sleep and the jailer's kind of going, didn't we beat them enough? All right, what is going on here? When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. He praised God in the darkest of hours. My heart is heavy today, but my anchor holds. My back is bloody, Paul is saying, and together they cry out, my anchor holds. My feet are bound, I cannot stand, but loudly they proclaim, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Can you imagine them singing this song together? You see, the devil made a mistake. A few years ago, there was a survey. A scientist did research on monkeys. To be specifically, two monkeys. All right? And they tested stress levels. So they, they hooked them all up, okay, and little EKGs and little EGs or whatever they put on monkeys. And then they, they put one monkey in a cage and they, they started to cause, they showed him pictures of, you know, the things that monkeys are afraid of, which I guess is like mama monkeys. Are, you know, I don't know what monkeys are afraid of. You know, you know, rotten bananas. Cause they, whatever, you know. But they showed them all the you know, alligators or lions or you know, snakes. And the monkeys got really scared. And their, their EEGs were off the charts. And the stress galore. They did the other monkey the same. And stress galore. But then they put the two monkeys together. And they gave them the same test. And the scientists discovered that the stress levels in their body was at half when they were together. Do you see the principle? The principle here that we, you know, that in all of this that is going on, uh, the monkeys that are left in isolation are stressed, but when you're together, when their monkeys are together, their stress is less. So we need each other. So Satan desires for us to be alone. So uh, Satan desires for us to be in isolation. Satan desires that we fight him in isolation. But science has shown, and I believe it's the same thing in scripture about unity in the body of Christ, that we are stronger together and we need each other as, as monkeys. So here's what I want you to do real quick. Turn to somebody. Imagine you're by yourself and you need another monkey. Will you turn to somebody right now and say, will you be my monkey? All right, now there are people like Cecil that are sitting alone. He needs a monkey, okay? Cecil, just so you're not alone. There you go, brother. Will you be my monkey, Cecil? Will you be my monkey? Okay, I'll be your monkey. Thank you, desire to fight in isolation. But you put those two together and they started praising God. You are here this morning at church. And you need to know you are not alone. We walk together. We do. And you could be alone. To be honest, you could be alone sitting in a crowd like this. But you need to know as the family of God, we've got your back. God is bigger. God is better and stronger. And there is no weapon that is formed against us shall prosper. Do you understand that? Jesus breaks bonds. And what happened? We know the rest of the story. Earthquake. All of the shackles fell off Paul and Silas. But you know what? The next day the king was going to, the magistrate was going to set them free anyway. Legally they were already free. 
But even before the magistrate and even before the shackles, they were already free. Because their freedom came in here and here. But there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Shackles cannot stop us from praising God. The devil may keep your feet from moving, but he can't keep your heart from singing. You may not, your hands may be bound, and you may not be able to lift them, but you can lift your voice, or you can lift your eyes, as the psalm says. Where do I lift my eyes? I lift them unto the Lord. From there comes my help. God is bigger. God is stronger. God opens the way. Here in Macedonia, God was, this was a very first movement. Just like Philip was a big movement into Samaria, this was a huge movement of the Christian movement into Europe. God, is, God opens the ways. God opens the heart. And the story was the, the jailer, remember? And Peter, the jailer, got killed. But here, the jailer was getting ready to kill himself. And what does Paul say? Don't do that. We're still here. Every one of us. And so the, the jailer took him home. The jailer fed him. The jailer worked on him, you know, gave him medicine. And before the night was over, the jailer, and the Bible says, in his whole household were baptized. God opens the way. God opens the doors. And God opens the What do you got to do? You got to praise. The first thing we see in this is no matter what's going on, do you believe? Do you believe that God is bigger? The only reason that Paul and Silas could sing praises is because their God was bigger than the prison that they were in. Do you believe that anything else that binds you, don't have any doubts, don't have any... Do you believe that there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus? When Satan tries to say you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty, and you say, yeah, I have messed up, but that has been paid for on the cross. Do you believe, if you believe in Jesus, do you believe that all your sins have been paid for? Then there should be no bond, bound, rope, chain, prison chains that can hold you. Sorry, get a little tongue tied there, see? Do you believe? Do you believe that no weapon formed against you shall prosper? Scripture is very, and that it says this: that every tongue that raises against God shall be condemned. Do you believe that God is bigger than anything this world throws at us? I weep over what happened to the pregnancy center in Lynchburg. I weep at all the protests and the media that it's getting. But you know what? I praise God that we are focusing on life. And I know the Supreme Court had nothing to do with abortion. It had to do with privacy and had to do with legal standards, but you know what we see it as? We see it has to do with life. And our God is bigger than any political group. I was told years ago that Roe v. Wade would never be taken away. Our God is bigger than any Supreme Court. Our God is bigger than any president. And our God is bigger than any one president. And I'm not saying red or blue here. I'm saying anyone present. Our God is bigger. We're looking at 2022, 23, building, doing things, and the fear of what is financially it's going to be like, is it going to crash? No, our God is bigger than all of that. Do you believe? Go back to the very first slide, will you? The, the slide on uh, Luke 4, 18. So I want to end with this as our praise team makes their way up. Do you believe in Jesus? And Jesus declared, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me, what? To proclaim liberty, freedom to the captive. He can open your doors and no matter what you're holding you back, God is bigger. And to recover the sight of the blind. You don't believe it? Just turn to him. Turn your eyes upon him and to set liberty at those who are oppressed. God may not deliver you from what you're going through here. But he will deliver you from what you're going through here. I said the exact same thing if you weren't paying attention. You may not be delivered here. James died. Stephen died. People are in prison and never get out. But if you believe in God, then you are already free. And in the end, we are set free. I know we got 
have some of Lori Dodd's family here, and I know others that are going through health crisis. There are things that we may never be delivered from or escape from in this world. Paul prayed, remove the thorn of the flesh, remove the thorn of the flesh, remove the thorn of the flesh. And what did Jesus say? My grace is sufficient. But we do know when this is all said and done, when the perishable is gone and we are living in the imperishable, we find true liberty and true freedom. So he may not deliver you here from what you're going through, but he will deliver you from what you're going through here. He is the chain breaker. And you are not alone. Maybe we're gonna have this, we're gonna sing that chain breaker song again. And maybe you just need to get up and walk across the room to somebody and says, Look, I'll be your monkey. I know that's kind of weird, but you get it. Maybe you need to say, This is where I want to be, and this is the church that I want to be part of. Or maybe you've never experienced the true freedom that Jesus brings. And you need to understand what that is. And I would love to share with you some more. We have a time for you to decide, do you believe that he is the chain breaker? Would you stand? Father, in the next few minutes, our online will be going away, but Lord, they can still reach out to us at any given point. Lord, but those that remain here, if we come to you saying you are the chain breaker, you are the one that brings no condemnation, and the verdict has already been played down if we believe in you. So God, right now, may each one, when they walk out of this room, know for certain they believe.